So every few months I like to do a load test on my main system and today we're running the EG4 6500EXs at 99% of their output capacity. Check it out, 99% of its output capacity. It hovers between 98 and 100. And all of these batteries behind me, except for the EcoFlow Delta Pros, are connected to these two units. We're actually charging up the EcoFlow Delta Pros. For this test, we're gonna run 98 kilowatt hours through these units and see if it can actually hold up without having an over temperature protection disconnect, an overload disconnect, or something else. Uh-oh, it just shut down. Gosh dang it. F07. Overload, it wasn't over temperature. I think my air conditioner ramped up and the current increased, unfortunately. So let's try the test again and ensure that it can hold that 99% output capacity for prolonged duration. So turn them off and turn them back on again. It does not want to restart. So setting number six is auto restart when overload occurs. We're going to actually enable that. There we go. Nice, there we go. And now we have power, so let's wait until it ramps up. So now we're at 98% uh oh, look at that, 120, so something's spiking. Yeah, I'm overloading it. It's so hard to do these load tests because you want a consistent load, but pulling 13,000 watts consistently is very difficult. This is the closest I can get at 96%, and it actually hovers between 96 and 98. Now we're gonna let it run for a few hours, but if an overload does occur and it shuts down both units, it will also turn off my EV charger, and then I'll have to manually reset everything like I did a few minutes ago. So even though it has an auto restart, it won't restart the loads again, and I will get a notification on my phone if that thing shuts down. So yeah, let's come back in a few hours and see if it can actually pull that whole 98 kilowatt hours. So the test has been running for two hours now and everything is working great. But this is a perfect opportunity to bring out the heat camera and see if there's any hot spots on any of the connections on our system. Now if you do not have a heat camera, I highly suggest you spend the money and actually get one. A lot of my friends told me to buy one and I did not listen to them. Now I use this thing all the time. You can find water pipes in walls. You can also find hot spots on solar cells, or you can inspect battery terminals if you have a massive 48 volt battery and you wanna see if there's any hot spots on top of your battery. Also, these are getting cheaper. Check out Amazon. I bought this one for like 200 or $300 and it works great. It does everything I need it to. Also, you can inspect high voltage connections without touching them. Previously, I would just touch all the wires and because they have insulation, I wouldn't worry about it. But when you have high voltage DC conductors, it's safer to use a heat camera to inspect them to see if there's any issues. Also for inspecting circuit breakers. I'm telling you, once you have one, you will love it. So I just turn it on. And then I just walk around and point it at all of the devices and see if there's anything that's overheating. Now the conductors are around 105 degrees Fahrenheit, but there's one part of this case right here and right here that's hitting 120 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's totally fine, that's not hot at all. I mean, it's like 112 degrees outside right now. We're in Las Vegas. And also point it at the circuit breakers and the bus bars, every single connection in your system. Also check out your panel. There's gonna be some hot spots with the circuit breakers that are under load, but yeah, there's no issues over here. Now the most important location for inspection of hot spots is the battery terminals. Time and time again, I find people with loose connections. So every few months you wanna test these connections and retorque them and inspect them with a heat camera. If a connection is not tight enough, it can overheat and melt the terminal or even worse, cause something nearby to combust and catch on fire. And it only takes a few seconds to do an inspection. Everything on this battery is below 83 degrees Fahrenheit. And the connections over here are 70 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And the connections over here are under 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So everything is looking fantastic. Now I'm using the TI-250 Thermal Imager by Klein Tools. I like Klein Tools, but there's other heat cameras out for the same cost that has more features. So yeah, check out the options on Amazon. This thing is very durable. I've dropped it a lot and I love Klein Tools. So I'll have a link for this one down below and it hasn't given me a single issue. And I've actually had this thing for about six months now. I just never mention it in the videos. But yeah, this is a fantastic tool. 
Also has an SD card and you can save the pictures and then upload them onto your computer and then use them for whatever you wish with lots of information. This thing's great. Now during that inspection I just did right now, there wasn't that much current going in and out of the batteries because there's a lot of solar power going into the system. So it's not drawing that much current from the battery bank. So the best time to do a heat inspection is when it's under load during the nighttime. That way you're pulling a lot of current from the batteries into the units and then you can inspect all of the connections. So it was still a good inspection but not necessarily for the battery connections. You really want to put the max load on those batteries when you're doing an inspection. And still after two hours, we're pulling 100 to 99% of the AC output capacity. So it has elevated a little bit, but this is fantastic for this test. Now something to keep in mind is I've seen some YouTubers compare high frequency inverters to LF or low frequency inverters that have massive transformers inside of them. And those are designed to run inductive loads like motors really well. So they'll take like a Solarc or an EG4 6500EX or they'll even take like a 6048 that's another high frequency inverter by MPP and they'll say, oh wow, it's not running my well pump. Oh, it's not running my air compressor. And then they'll compare it to an LF inverter that can run it flawlessly. And that's simply because an LF inverter has a larger surge capacity and it can run inductive loads better. So it's not fair to compare this type of inverter, an HF inverter, to an LF inverter for starting those types of loads. Also, an HF inverter can run any inductive load, you just need to size it accordingly. I saw some YouTubers making these comparisons and I was like, that's not fair at all. You have to look up the surge capacity and do your calculations. If it doesn't run your load, it's because you are the problem, not the device. LF inverters have like three or four times the surge capacity of an HF inverter. Um, these can max out at like two times their max continuous uh, AC output rating. So yeah, I don't think that's fair at all and I don't know why those YouTubers are doing that. Personally, I prefer HF inverters because they're easier to install. LF inverters are very heavy and you have to spend a lot of money if you want to have a low idle consumption. And you'll notice that budget low frequency inverters will have higher idle consumption. Um, not with the Victron, obviously. Um, it has a specialized software that they took a long time to develop. But with those cheap Chinese LF inverters, the idle consumption is like double that of one of these HF inverters from China. Now I still need to make a video about LF versus HF inverters. I've talked about it a lot in older videos and we even talked about the temperatures that the FETs run out, how the different designs of transformers used in LF inverters, but I never put them together in a single video. So I still need to do that. That. But yeah, if you see someone online trying to compare an LF inverter to an HF inverter and say, oh, it keeps shutting down, of course it's going to shut down. LF inverters can handle a massive surge capacity, so please stop comparing those. Now let's continue this test, but I just realized that this PV array is so massive, it's like 10,000 watts, that it's charging whatever is discharging. So these batteries are not discharging at all, really. Um, it can run this load all day long when the sun is out. What this system mainly runs is the air conditioner at night. It will be like 105 degrees out here in Las Vegas, and this needs enough battery capacity to keep that heat pump running all night long. So for me, that's my main load, and that's why it's great to have a massive battery. But doing a load test does help find hot spots and to see if the system can actually handle it. Um, having multiple loads all connected and having an imbalance is fantastic. You should do it every couple of months. Anyways, we'll come back later and see how well this test is doing. Also, a quick update of my grade B cells. This is 30 kilowatt hours, and I use this as a backup if my main system is down, or if it's a really hot day and I need the air conditioning powered by that system, I'll charge my car with this one. And then when we have a day with excess power, then I charge this thing back up, which means with both systems, we have 130 kilowatt hours available, actually 128. Also, I found a bad connection. It was like a month ago, but I found it with the heat camera. I put a massive load on this battery for a few hours and then I caught it and I torqued it down and there hasn't been a problem since. And I talk about the importance of tight connections in like every other video and I had a loose connection. So yeah, the heat camera is really nice. It's game changing. Now it's late afternoon and the test is finally done. It's nice and quiet. The inverter and MPPT fans are not blowing as hard. Now, unfortunately, 
unfortunately we didn't draw that much current from the batteries because I've been running this off mainly off of the solar array outside. And out here in Las Vegas, we get about 45 to 55 kilowatt hours a day. Um, I would get a lot more out here, but there's a livestock shade on one side of my property and it shades in the late afternoon, especially right now. Also, my Model X was not fully discharged. It was about at 50% state of charge, and then we charged it up to 100%. So with that and the air conditioner, it pretty much just offset the loads. So we didn't use that much battery capacity, but we did get to run this system. It pretty much its maximum output for most of the day. Now this system at night running the heat pump at full blast will use quite a bit more power, but it's pretty efficient. Um, I don't really have any issues. I never draw this down to zero and I never charge it all the way up because if I need to, I just charge up the car. But yeah, it works. It's a LV6548 that's slightly modified and so far everything has worked fantastically. And I have six of these units in my possession in this shop right now. So I know this unit pretty well. And again, I've never had any problems with it. I put megawatt hours through multiple of these without any issues at all. And the EG4 inverter is no different. It's just the same as these. Now another update is the EcoFlow Delta Pros. I connected a larger array with some bifacial solar panels and I've been running the heat pump for a few months 24 seven. And I've had zero issues, but the one thing that I've complained about multiple times is it will not turn on the inverter with just a DC input alone. It will turn on the inverter if you have an AC input connected, but not with solar panels and it drives me nuts. Now I did think of a solution if you're not using it as a standalone off-grid system. You could use a wall outlet switch to turn this thing back on with the AC input remotely or with a timer. You could use that switch to turn it on in the morning before it gets solar and just have it on for like one minute, just long enough to turn on the inverter and to wake it up. But I think it should have it built in. I'm really bummed about that. I hope that they have a firmware update. I really need to email them because I bet they could fix that. Anyways, it's been running great. I run it 24 seven and if your array size is large enough, it won't turn off at all. So no issues there with this unit. And that's pretty much it. I can't think of anything else I want to mention. Um, I'll have some more videos coming out. There's really cool products hitting the market. And yeah, a lot of people I think though are probably going to stick with LV6548s and server rack batteries. It is such a solid combo and you can run an entire house for very cheap. If you compare the price of these to like a Soul Arc or any of the other ones, I mean, this is a fraction of the cost. And I run these 24 seven and they have the UL certificates. And I've owned six units without any issues. So yeah, highly recommend these. They're easy to install, nice and light, and they run anything that you would ever need. I am itching to swap this out for Victron inverters, but I really don't need to, and I love this configuration. It's so easy to work on and to check everything. But those are very nice inverters. They cost a lot of money but they're very nice. And then I'd have to wire up some solar charge controllers over here. So that wouldn't be very fun. And there'd be a lot more wires. This is so clean and easy. Anybody can look at this and copy it. I love it. Anyways, thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video. Bye.